Uh, first, I'll make an apology that uh, I'm not giving you this uh, talk uh, in German. Uh, my German is certainly not good enough. Um, I'll try and make it uh, as straightforward as possible for those that English is not uh, even their first language. Need me to speak up? Just the mic. To turn it up. Is there a volume on this? Just up a bit. Is that better? Excellent. Okay. Okay, so my name uh, is Andy Robinson. Um, I'm the current secretary of the OpenStreetMap Foundation. The foundation is uh, basically a facilitator to enable the project, the OpenStreetMap project, to, uh, to function. It looks after the servers uh, that the project needs to make uh, the project run. Uh, it is, acts as the body that uh, takes in sponsorship money. It organizes the conference that we run each year, that sort of thing. So it's a facilitator. It doesn't control the project. The OpenStreetMap project is very much controlled by the community itself. So, a few maps for you. What exactly is OpenStreetMap? Might look like any ordinary map. In fact, it probably looks to you just like any map at Google, for instance. Very little difference. So what is the big deal? Why OpenStreetMap in the first place? Well, the primary difference is it's wiki-like. We have full control of the history of every edit that is made. So unlike any other map out there, we know precisely what the data is and uh, what its history is. And the wiki aspect also means that you can add whatever you like. So if there is something on the map that you would like to see, then you can add it. Add it to the data. There's no restriction. You can add whatever you like. And basically, if it's fixed to the ground, part of the urban or natural environment, it's the sort of data that we want in OpenStreetMap. And since it's your data, basically it's provided and created by the contributors, by you, you can do what the hell you like with it. And that literally means that. I mean, you can take the data in whatever format and render it in a version that you, that you like. You can take a subset of the data and create either a map or an application from it and do exactly what you want with it. So this is where the real big difference is. Unlike the Google map or, or mapping from the likes of uh, Teleatlas or Navtech, who are the two big providers to, um, to, to companies like Google, they restrict very heavily the map data itself. It's one view of the data that you get to look at on Google. You don't have layering and the capabilities to turn things on and off. So you're stuck with that view. You don't have that restriction with OpenStreetMap. And that's where we are. Now I'll just run back through that sequence. And instead of looking at the words, just look at the map itself. And this just comes down to where we are today at different zoom levels. You start to see that, for instance, on that map, there's an awful lot more data uh, in the Netherlands and into Germany. But you can start to see just how much data has been put into the map already. The project's only been running since 2004. And in reality, only adding data since 2005. So we're just coming basically three years of data, and we're already at this level of richness. We get down to street level and all the street names, and we start to see some of the buildings going in. Why? Well, I've already given you one reason why. 
and that's because the likes of Google and the other providers out there don't make their data available freely. It's either going to cost you a lot of money, or the terms under which you get the data means that it's very restricted. You can't take the data and produce just what you want with it. The, the people that own that data control what you can do with it in many cases. And as a result, there's an awful lot of things you can't do. So OpenStreetMap grew out of the, the wish by people to do innovative things with map data. And that's really what the project's about. The other reason is why not? <laughs> Most of us are in this because we enjoy doing one aspect of it. By profession, I have nothing to do with maps, I have nothing to do with computers, I have nothing to do with writing code or developing anything. I'm a civil engineer, I design tunnels. So why am I here speaking to you today in a developers type conference? Well, because I'm really passionate about what this project is. And you'll see a little bit more about how that comes out as we go along. The project is uh, all the data uh, is contributed and made available under the Creative Commons uh, sh Attribution Share Alike version 2 currently. We are investigating at the moment a slight change in the, in the license, not to change away from that basis that the, uh, uh, the, the CC license is, but we have a problem in that data and databases were not designed to be covered by this type of creative license. And as a result, we have found some difficulties in allowing the data to be used in certain environments certain, for certain uses. And also there are some difficulties with giving attribution. How do you attribute several thousand users who are contributing data, for instance? So we're, we've been looking at and we are in the process of recommending or hopefully recommending a, 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 an open data license being specifically tailored for OpenStreetMap, but we're hoping we'll see wider use in the community that deals with data. It's not a Creative Commons license, though. I shan't go into the reasons for that. Um, partly they're polit political and partly they are uh, a difference in direction of where Creative Commons has decided to go with data. So how does it all work? Well, what's under the hood? This is our database store. As you can see, it's a, a mobile platform. Um, the reason I put the slide up is because it demonstrates really what OpenStreetMap is. All OpenStreetMap is a huge, great, big bin full of data. Okay, it's stored on some servers, and it has a format, um, and what have you. But fundamentally, the project is about collecting and storing geographic data uh, and other attributes that relate to that geographic data. In reality, we have it a little more sophisticated than that. The reason why this is particular version is that Steve Coast, the founder of the project, recently moved to California, and so we wanted to show that uh, he'd taken the database with him. Just to give you a few statistics, the database itself is a MySQL database on the back end. We currently have uh, 57, 000, just over 57,000 registered users which is doubling every five months. So you can very quickly see how, we're, in terms of the ramp up, every five months, and that's historically uh, five months, right since the beginning of the project, how big the project's getting, but also how much data's going in, how quickly. We have currently about 11.5% of our registered users are actively contributing data each month. So that's currently around just over 6,000 users each month worldwide are contributing data to the database. So far, we have something like 20 million kilometers of highway. That's uh, roads, basically. That doesn't include all the other linear features like railways, waterways, anything else that's that type of feature. So that's just roads. We have over half a million uh, places around the world, cities, towns, villages, and what have you. Uh, the backbone of how the data is created, which I will show you shortly, is created off uh, GPS data. We have some 425 million points of data. And we have 282 million geographical elements. That's the pure elements that make up whether it be a point or, or a line uh, or an area. 
And the most important thing is we have the history of every edit that's made within the database. When you put that database and look at it in terms of its physical size, if we take the whole of, uh, for instance, Wikipedia EN, the EN version, our database is significantly larger than that already by a huge magnitude. Okay, if you take all of, the, of, of Wikipedia and all its languages and everything else, then it's still bigger than as a project and, and in terms of data size. But this project will ultimately far out flips Wikipedia just because of the sheer volume of data that's going in. A lot of people ask me, well, what's the difference between Wikipedia and OpenStreetMap? The main difference is, uh, and this is an important point because it comes about as a question quite often about how reliable is the data. Wikipedia has taken a lot of uh, criticism in, in all fields uh, over the last year or two regarding whether or not you can trust the data. And there will always be an element of, well, can you trust the data in OpenStreetMap? Because if it's produced and, uh, by contributors, then obviously those contributors could put absolutely anything in they like. The point, though, is that we can verify factual data because we can see it on the ground. If there's a street there and it has a certain name, we can verify that. We can take a picture of it or we can find some other way of verifying it. And that's very different from Wikipedia, which is a lot of subjective comment, and a lot of uh, uh, personal opinion about what something is or what something is just being discussed, the subject matter. OpenStreetMap, we're very much dealing with pure facts. And as a result, it's very easy to verify it, even if it's been put in wrongly. How, we, how do we communicate with this database? Well, we, uh, we operate um, through an API. It's a RESTful API, basically talking XML. Uh, the back end is a Ruby on Rails install, which is talking to the MySQL database. And that's the fundamental part of communicating with the database. That's both data going in, and also immediately you can retrieve that same data back out again. There are many other services that are peripheral to that core function. We make available the whole of the data set in what we call the planet file. And that's dumped each, uh, usually comes out each Wednesday by the time it's compressed. It's a pretty large file now. You can't work with it at all in its uncompressed format, so all the tools work with it in its compressed. It's several gigabytes compressed. And then we, on top of that, have daily, hourly, and minute dif difference files that allow somebody to keep up to date and keep their planet file current, even up to, to the minute. So if you're using something and doing development work, taking the data and rendering it yourself or using it yourself, you wouldn't, you wouldn't do that directly through the main API, but you are able to keep very much up to date uh, with the data to be able to use it as a user. Then we have um, services such as uh, rendering tiles and making those available, and that's the tile is the format of a raster image so that we can display all this vector data that we've got. Uh, in a format that everybody can view. In other words, just as we've been looking at the maps just now, that's rendered vector data uh, in a raster format. We have two primary uh, default versions, what we call the MapNIC tiles. MapNIC is a piece of software that, uh, that works off uh, a separate database. We load the planet into that database. The database then turns that into raster images. MapNIC turns it into raster images. Uh, with the tiles at home, which is a, a, a totally different process, Osmorenda is a piece of uh, code that basically takes XML through a style sheet transformation, turns it into SVG. SVG is then turned into a, a raster image to be able to show it on uh, a website. Or you can leave it as SVG and use it in your own format to create and leave it in vector format and, and produce maps that are particularly styled the way you want them. We have a name finder, which is essentially a search facility to, to find places through the data, through the website. We have a data browser that allows us to very simply look at individual components of the data and see who put it in, when it was put in, what the various tags are that have been applied to it. 
And then we have a map export facility, which allows us to print uh, a raster image or export it as a PDF or take the data for that little block of area that you're interested in as XML. And then finally we have a development server, which currently is not that heavily used, and I'll explain a little bit more why as we go along, but the dev server is available to anybody to have an account on uh, to do their own development work within the project. On the software side, the main data editors, that's the facility to create the mapping data, uh, there's an online version called Potlatch, which is written in Flash. Um, and we have a offline uh, Java implementation, which works in a different way, but does the same thing. And uh, it's called JOSM. The map displays on the main website is all done through um, open layers. That seems to be the one that everybody's going for these days. Certainly works well enough, and that's the easiest way to put one of the OpenStreetMap slippy maps on your own website, is just take the uh, standard open layers. <clears throat> I've already explained Osmoranda is XSLT to SVG. There's lots of other small pieces of code that do all sorts of tasks, work with the data in different ways, do specific jobs, and they've been written by any number of people, and you can find just about any coding language there, there'll be something. Many of the satellite projects that have come about, and some of the things that are already, I've talked about things like Name Finder, the Data Browser, these are all actually sub-projects that were developed away from OpenStreetMap by one or more of the contributors. Developed away from the development server, they just did them on their own, and then they've been brought in, people have started to use them, they've been seen as cool, and they get merged into the main code base. Interest, in terms of what people are doing, well, obviously the obvious one is cartography because that's what everybody understands, producing maps, and there are people obviously using it for that. There's a lot of people who are interested in the environmental aspects, the fact that you can not have a standard view of the mapping and you can actually uh, start taking a subsection of it, whether it be for recycling of recycling centers, being able to show maps with all of those sort of things on, to looking at land use. Humanitarian and disaster relief, we've just started to see that coming about. There's one or two, including the UN organizations, that are very keen to really embrace and start using our platform to develop, to develop maps in areas that don't have mapping. Disaster relief especially. So many of the disasters around the world occur in places with no maps, or effectively no maps because they're so out of date. And so, the ability to go in with very, very simple equipment and very quickly map a place to allow transportation and allow communities to, to connect with each other is a real, seen as a real benefit. And we've just started to see some of that coming about. Uh, navigation and routing is probably, together with mobile apps, the next one. Those are the two areas with probably the most interest in around the globe at the moment from, from the developer side and from, to be honest, from the wider community. Mobile phones, of course, are all going GPS enabled. They'll all be displaying maps. Many of the top end machines now, of course, are. So there's a need for, for mapping on those devices. Uh, routing in terms of getting from A to B, the sort of thing you would see on an in-car, sat-nav, tom-tom nav tech type device. Um, there's no reason why it can't be showing OpenStreetMap data. Yes, TomTom and NavTech devices, not all of those can pick and choose what maps you display. Some of them are very much linked into the supplier, um, but there are plenty of devices out there that can show OpenStreetMap data. And certainly on phones, it's not a problem at all. The last item I just put out there is, is a bit of fun. There's a lot of people talking about it, but not really much has been done yet. But we think there's going to be some real cool games coming out from actually using, taking OpenStreetMap data, real data, uh, instead of the fictional data that you might have some, in com some computer games. Just imagine Grand Theft Auto with OpenStreetMap in your hometown. <laughs> well, it's all possible because there's no restriction on that data. You can do what you like with it. Okay, so let's go mapping, shall we? What do we need? Brought a few little things on. 
we've got to think of the health and safety aspect, but it's also good. This piece, this device is the, the best thing to stop you getting asked stupid questions in the street because it tells you what you are on the back. <laughs> then we need one of these devices, uh, a little handheld GPS device. This is a Garmin uh, unit. Or you could be using your mobile phone with a Bluetooth GPS puck. Or you might be using um, uh, an embedded de uh, device on, on your phone that is something that will collect a, a trace of where you've been these sort of things will do that every second. Some of them take, uh, do it over a longer period of time. But essentially, we need a GPS device. Then I might also, for me, I will take a camera. Or you can use a notebook or a dictaphone. So this is to take a record of what I've actually seen. Street names, the names of the schools, hospitals, churches, whatever, whatever you would like to have on the map. Obviously, take a record of it so that you can then add it. And then I'll go out, my preferred mode of uh, transport is the push bike. So I'm cycling everywhere. Uh, there are those that uh, will be doing it by car. Some will be doing it on foot. There'll be one or two that are doing it by horse and anything else you can think of. Take the dog for a walk. And then you go wandering around your streets and uh, collecting the information. When you come back, you upload the trace from your device up onto the website. That's the page on the website that just shows uh, some of my traces. And uh, each one gets uploaded and is then available for anybody. If you make it public, anybody can uh, uh, access that same trace and make use of the data. Anything that you upload to the database is taken in as points to the database as a reference. But if you make it public, it also means anybody can download that whole trace and make use of it as well. Most people in the project make theirs available. Once you've, uh, once you've down, uh, uploaded the, uh, the GPX, or in this case, using the offline editor, I don't need to upload it, but uh, I do anyway. This is showing in, in pink, you can just about pick out. They are GPX traces, lots of them from different, different trips laid over the top of each other. So you can just about see that certain routes I, this is my home area in the UK, you can see that I've done more times down the same route than other routes. The blue and the yellow lines there, that's editing on top, adding points, what we call nodes, and lines, which we call ways, connecting those points up to create the streets. So it's a manual process of conversion. If you're going across the wilderness of Alaska, and you're the only one that's ever been down a road, then you can directly convert the GPX track to, um, to the, the, the format of nodes and, and the way. But for most people who are editing, you actually have to do it manually. Uh, because if I was to do a new, a new route through and convert it, then I'd just be duplicating a lot of data. The online uh, editor called Potlatch, this is that... Uh, uh, picture with uh, Yahoo aerial imagery under it. This happens to be Heathrow Airport in London. And uh, because we have a gr an agreement with Yahoo that allows us to derive data from their aerial imagery. The disadvantage is that a Yahoo don't have a huge amount of aerial imagery available. So there's big cities around the world are covered. Quite a lot of certain odd places are covered. But beyond that, uh, they don't have good coverage. Good coverage in North America, the USA mainly is covered with reasonable data, but once you start coming outside, Europe is hit and miss, and beyond that, it's uh, non-existent, other than for certain big capital cities of the world. Uh, another option is uh, in, in the UK, this is uh, out of copyright uh, mapping. So this is another source we can use. If, it's, if the original map is out of copyright, then we can make use of it as a as a reference source. The problem here, I haven't got a pointer, but you can see up in the top left, uh, especially, there's a lot of white roads there that appear not on the original map. And that's, of course, because the mapping here was the original uh, to copyright mapping dates from the 1940s. And there's an awful lot of houses being built in, uh, in many of the cities of the world since then. 
So it's very useful for getting things like the routes of railway lines and canals and rivers and natural features that are on the map. It's not so good for doing urban areas. But it's another source that we use. Once we put these lines in, dots and lines, join it all up, we need to start adding all the rich textural information that allows us to make really creative maps. So we call this tagging. And basically tagging is a very simple, unstructured process. It has a structure, but there is no standard to it. It's all based on a key and value. <coughs> Excuse me. The key describes the main uh, object. So for instance, a highway. And then the value is the particular type. So motorway uh, in this case. Now, most of the tags have traditionally been created in English. They don't have to be. Because there is no standard, you can actually use whatever you like. So you could actually make all, do all yours, highway equals autobahn, no problem at all. And what you're then saying to those that want to use the data is you've got to be clever. Don't just assume it's going to be motorway. If you're making a map of Germany, assume that there might be some data that is highway equals autobahn. So what we're saying is we don't put the standards within an open street map. We make the people that are using the data be a bit cleverer than having to assume that, they, that everything fits to a standard. The reason we can't fit to a standard, and there's been huge debates about it, especially in Germany, is that we are talking about users who don't understand about using standards or don't want to be able to have that level of restriction. They want to be able to have fun and enjoy this process of doing mapping. It's a lot easier just to tell them all to map and tag what you see and use logical tags and make use of them. So although we provide some guides and there's a particular set of, um, of tags which most people use by default, it's called map features, uh, those we tend, everybody tends to use and by repeated use, everybody using the same thing, it becomes a pseudo standard. But there is, you will not find it written in stone. It's, it, stone there isn't a requirement to use that tagging method. So we've got other types of things. Uh, amenity equals school, just the same sort of thing if we're tagging a school. The bottom one, horse equals yes, is a bit of a joke. Um, if you've got uh, the ability to ride a, a horse down a particular street, then people add that sort of tag. And uh, it's, a, it's a little bit of an in, internal joke that uh, that came up one day on, on the IRC chat about horse, horse equals yes, so it tends to get used a lot. I should point out that the, one of the main reasons OpenStreetMap started and continues is to ensure that we map every single bar and pub in the world. And so amenity equals pub is one of the most important tags you should know. Okay? <laughs> Just uh, going back to now rendering, that's basically the same sort of thing we saw earlier in, in JOSM, uh, the wireframe just without the GPX underneath it. And I can then take that data, just literally within JOSM, export it to XML and turn it using Osmoranda straight into SVG. And that's exactly what that is, just uh, SVG, and that's probably an Inkscape or something just displayed. For this, it obviously will have been uh, turned into a, a raster. But <clears throat> the point that I want to make here is that you can see the colors are all different there. You can make a map with what you want, whatever colors you like, if you want it for your own specific use. Or you can stick to some style sheet set of guidelines that other people have used before or that the main website for OpenStreetMap is using. But you can configure whatever you like and, uh, and do whatever you want with it. And that's, this is probably our best example at the moment of somebody doing that. And this is a guy called Andy Allen and a couple of his mates uh, put together what we call the cycle map, which is the same data. It's all open street map data taken and given a different perspective. What happens is that uh, for cycle routes, they get tagged up with a certain set of tags, which allows Andy and uh, his, his process using Mapnik to highlight those by putting a different style on them. Everything else is grayed back. The other difference you'll notice is that this map has contours on it. The main OpenStreetMap 
doesn't have contours on it, not because we can't, but because we found that there isn't really a need to do it at the moment. Contours are needed by walkers and cyclists. They're of less interest to other people. So contours come not from within OpenStreetMap itself. This uses the SRTM uh, shuttle radar data, which is freely available, and uh, creates shapefiles uh, to put it for the map. So what you end up with is OpenStreetMap data incorporating some, but something else and highlighting a certain feature of the OpenStreetMap data. So in a way, it's a bit of a mashup, but you wouldn't be able to tell from, from looking at that. It's not like a Google mashup, is it? Spoke briefly earlier about the data viewer. <clears throat> this is the website showing the data viewer. On the right hand side, when you open up the website, there's a little plus button, and at the bottom you hit the data, and it will bring up this left hand pane, which shows you the object. And you can see the lower section that says the history for this, the particular street, which is the street out front here. And if I was to click on the details alongside, that's what it would show me, which is showing me the nodes and the tags uh, for both, both parts of the history, so the most recent edit and the previous edit. It's not the only way we can get it. We can actually call the API directly and get the same information as XML. This is just a visual way of representing it. But it's very handy when you want to find out who actually put something in, because the names of the users are there. So you can click on that username and send them an email message if you need to contact them. So you, you, you've got a question about it, or you're going to be in that area, or whatever. The export tab <clears throat> does the same sort of function, in that it gives you a set of options. Uh, we can export the data as XML for the area that you're looking at. Uh, a mapnik image, um, which will either be PNG, GIF, I think, and, um, uh, and PDF. Not sure we've got any others. Um, the Osmorender version do the, basically the same. Uh, or we can take an em embedded HTML piece so that you can slot that into your own website and show that same map on your website. So we're making it easier for people to get maps. They don't, if they're not wanting to spend all the time and to develop something themselves, they can just pull something off and use it. That's the version that's showing the PNG of this area. That's the export in XML version. This is just the very top of the file, but that's the sort of thing that it looks like. Uh, that's just showing the first lines uh, and showing nodes. You get towards the bottom, you see a node there which is, uh, says highway, bus stop, and the name. Most of the earlier nodes don't have tags, so they'll be just nodes along a highway, don't have any other attribute. The user pages, if you log in, then you get, a, you get to your own user page, this is mine, and it allows you to uh, put in a bit of a description about yourself, um, collect together some friends, so people that you, you know and how far they are away, and so you can communicate with them. The lower part of the page allows you to see what other mappers are in, in your local area. Um, you don't have to, this is, this is something that they don't, you only have to do if you want, is to set your location, and some people set their location totally away from where they live, just for privacy reasons. But uh, others will set it pretty much bang on where they live, and it allows you to see who's in your local area. Now, some of those users may be interested in mapping with you. Some of them may not. It just depends on what their interest in the project is. And we have coming to some of the projects that are not part of OpenStreetMap, but are very much driven by it and are working for the benefit of the project in reality. This is one that's come about very recently. This is uh, by a company called ITO in, in the UK. Uh, Peter Miller is the, uh, uh, the owner of that company, and he's been very, very uh, involved in OpenStreetMap for a long time and uh, continues to support the project. Um, and they've produced this little tool, which is very useful for taking an area. Again, this is this wider local area around this, around this place here. And it allows you to see all the users that have created data in the, in the area. And if you click on each one of those users, you will actually it will highlight in the left-hand side what roads were, were added by that particular user. 
So it's very easy, very useful for, for seeing how things are changing because you can do it by time as well. So you can see in the last week what's been added, see where people are editing, um, and, uh, and either get in contact if you want or just fill out another area. It helps, helps with conflict as well because if you're not communicating with everybody, there's a danger that you both end up mapping the same area. Open street bugs is another one which is a, a, a and making a, a much simpler way for the wider public or somebody that doesn't want to learn how to make edits in the map to notify of a problem or something that needs to be added or something that needs to be corrected. And it's essentially a, a simple mashup type situation by putting pinpoints on, on open street map data uh, with a little box. You add your little note in. This is questioning whether or not uh, it's an official cycle way or just a piece of cycle track. And then whoever is mapping that area and has an interest in that area can have a look at the bugs and correct them, sort things out. And these are the sort of things that are at the moment they're outside, they sit on separate domains. These are the sort of projects that are likely to get incorporated into the main web interface of OpenStreetMap with time. Another one, this is uh, Bonn University um, Open Route Service, which is, they've done a lot of work in, in developing routing. Uh, this just takes, this is just putting in a route from a hospital or whatever it is, uh, health center round to our location here on foot. <coughs> Pedestrian access. So it shows you can use the, the, the data quite happily for routing now. Our problem is that we don't have the ability to uh, be certain that we've dealt with things like turn restrictions if you're in a car. Can you turn like left or right at a particular junction? That's the sort of extra data that needs to go into OpenStreetMap that's not really there at the moment. But certainly for getting from A to B uh, by foot or bike, it's, uh, it's, it's a very handy tool. And there's a lot more that you can see within that, uh, within that project. So my title for this was Where the World Hangs Out. <coughs> And the reason for it is because I don't really need to explain to you, but I do need to explain sometimes to other uh, groups we give this talk to, is that really this is all about building a community. OpenStreetMap only works because of the community itself. And so we like to have fun. Traditionally, one of the biggest ways of doing that is to organize uh, mapping parties, which is getting people together in a particular location that hasn't been mapped, and everybody goes off and does some mapping. And it's a great way to meet people, uh, have fun. This happens to be in Italy, I think, this one. So it's all about the social side. Because we are not all, I'm a civil engineer, as I said earlier, other people are, again, not cartographers, computer people, or, or um, uh, uh, the like. Uh, so they come from, everybody comes from all walks of life. So it's a slightly different type of uh, community that we've created here. And so there's a lot of interest. When you get together, you find out an awful lot about other things. Uh, great way to meet people, new people in new fields. You learn an awful lot from that. We also do hack days. Uh, this was one in London at uh, Multimaps offices, and uh, those come up now and again. If you, the key, though, is, is the po to point out that because it's a very open community, is that you, really you organize these things yourselves. OpenStreetMap as a project doesn't organize these things for you. It just takes one or two people to have an interest in doing a hack day and just setting it up, and then other people will come along. Okay, communication, um, the way that everybody communicates. We have IRC, a channel which um, has usually about 120 to 130 people on it all the time. Most of those that are the key developers or key sysadmins hang out on that. So if you've got a specific question, that's the best place to get it answered quickly. Mailing lists, just about in every language. Uh, the TalkDE German mailing list is the largest. National website portals, um, not in every country, but OpenStreetMap.org is the main website, but um, other people have registered OpenStreetMap, in case of DE uh, and other countries, 
Uh, we don't make any restrictions on that. We allow people to, to do that. There's no, there's no problem with uh, the setting up a different portal, which allows to focus the, uh, I'll show you the DE one in a minute. Um, there's a forum for those that don't like working with, uh, with traditional mailing lists. And of course, we can email everybody else through the website. And that's done without giving out email addresses to keep it uh, private. That's the uh, OpenStreetMap DE portal. The other main way of communicating is through the wiki, the project wiki, which has now something like 20,000 pages in the different languages. Um, so it can be a little bit difficult and daunting to find what you want. We try and actually have some simple starting points. So if you're new to the project, you can, as a newbie, you can actually find out a little bit about it uh, and other things that are focused on developers. Uh, but that's where really all the main points to the resource are. You won't find everything on there because in some cases what's being developed is being developed away from the project itself. But you'll generally find something about it and all the links in the wiki itself. You'll find, that, find enough information to get you, the, get you to where you need to be. Um, there's a book for your benefit of the, those the German speakers here. Um, which uh, I can recommend. That's uh, produced by a couple of uh, contributors who formed a small company. And then finally, just on the code side, we need more code. Um, and I don't say we as, I mean, the project needs more code. The project needs more code in lots of areas. Uh, it needs people to, to have a real interest and uh, in OpenStreetMap and, and just go away and, and create some of these new things like an open bugs, like a, a routing service, this, that and the other. It needs people to, to spend time and effort doing that. But I have to say that the best way to, to, to know whether you're the right person for that is to go out and do some mapping yourself first. You'll either find it totally addictive and won't stop um, or you'll do a little bit and go away from it. And if you do a little bit and go away from it, then probably writing code for open streets maps not for you. But there's certainly, uh, I would say, nearly all of the developers who spend any real time at putting code into the code base in all of these projects within OpenStreetMap, I think almost without exception, they all have done at least some mapping, if not quite a lot. You can get at all the main code on the, uh, the website, for the website and everything else and how the back end works uh, through Subversion uh, or you can browse it all through, through track. So SVN or track at uh, .org will take you to those two places and basically they show the same thing. Obviously track will give you a, 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 you know, a simple way of viewing through the code, see what's there. Uh, you won't find things like open street bugs, um, the routing stuff, you won't find that sort of stuff on there. Uh, because they've been developed outside the project. Ultimately, many of them do, do come under subversion in the end and come into the main code base. Um, once you get into the thing, uh, we, we have three main areas. Sites is everything that makes the site run. That's everything from the website through to the back end that does the service. <coughs> then we have applications, which is everything to do with the editors, the rendering, all that sort of stuff. And then we have miscellaneous, which tends to be the tools that get used for oddball things or where people are just trying stuff out. And as I said, generally speaking, all the links to the other sub-projects that are being developed outside of OpenStreetMap Central itself, uh, you'll generally find links to those on the wiki. So there's a huge amount of opportunities for people to try things out. Some of them are very, very basic and don't really require much coding skills at all. I mean, I, as I said earlier, I'm not, a, I'm not a computer program of any sort at all, but I can get to buy and write a few lines of JavaScript, and that's all I need to be able to put a slippy map on a website using OpenStreetMap data. So it is very, very simple to make a start. So there is something for everybody in there. And if you want really know a lot more about us, of course, come and see you guys up on the stand upstairs and uh, they'll explain how the process works in more detail if you want to. But with that, I'll thank you very much for listening to me and invite you to ask any questions. But before I do that, I'd just like to say thank you to CloudMade, um, who enabled me to get here all the way from the UK and paid the fee um, for the airfare. So I need to say thanks to them. They're one of the new upstarts of the, uh, 
uh, of open street map beyond taking things into the commercial sector. We'll start to see, I'm sure, a lot more companies starting to build actually off OpenStreetMap as a product itself, starting to take things into the commercial arena. Okay, thank you. Okay, well on the first point, um, height data for the GPX track is not at the moment imported into the, DPX, in, into the database for GPX points. All we take is the latitude and longitude and the timestamp. Um, the timestamp helps with just managing um, tracks in their entirety. Um, it would be no difficulty in including the, uh, the, uh, the height data. The reason we decided fairly early on not to bother with putting it into that level is that it's not very accurate. Um, and historically, GPS devices were very, very inaccurate at uh, giving that. So the, the difference now, though, with the very high sensitive receivers that, uh, that are now available, it it's much better. We can get much more uh, accuracy because we are seeing more satellites, and therefore height data is more accurate. But it's not really any more accurate than the SRTM free data that's out there. And so we took the decision not to bother with height data. There are people working and having a look and, and, and doing, uh, doing some things with height data from GPX uh, information within OpenStreetMap right now. Um, and I think we'll start to see more height information going on certain objects um, to, for instance, help people produce routes that explain to them what the sort of profile of the route is if they're cycling or walking. Um, but you can do the same sort of thing from SRTM data too, on the whole, although Obviously, if you're down in a canyon and the, the data is not that good from, uh, from, from the uh, satellite uh, uh, source, then um, uh, there's going to be a limit to how accurate it's going to be. The second point was... If the map data was uh, Yes. So if... if uh, well, we get this quite often. I mean, to give you the best example, the company A&D um, in the Netherlands gave us the whole of the Netherlands. Um, now, that didn't negate OpenStreetMap um, at all. In fact, it's, if anything, it's benefited because what it enables is that, that that was very good quality data, but it didn't have everything. Um, and it's allowed the Netherlands to start adding lots of extra data into their data set and just taking that level of richness right up. So, if anything, it's a benefit. It, it, the other reason that OpenStreetMap started was to put pressure on especially government institutions and, and, and uh, agencies to release more of their data into either into the public domain or at least into some uh, ability for other people to use it. And uh, in an ideal world, we'd have everybody releasing their base data set or companies like the Ordnance Survey is the one in the UK that we really want to see releasing their very simple street, date, uh, street data set into the, into the, uh, the public domain. And if OpenStreetMap makes that happen, brilliant. Uh, I have just two questions. How much does this uh, GPS device cost? And um, did I get it right? You just turn on the device, walk through the streets, and afterwards you edit uh, the collected data uh, on, uh, on the snap data? Yes, the, uh, this device that I have um, costs about, uh, we were looking at it earlier actually, I think it was about 178 euros. Um, this one will display OpenStreetMap mapping on it as well. So that's, if you like, it's not the top end range of a, of a satellite navigation device, but it's uh, the ideal sort of device with, uh, with OpenStreetMap um, because you can display our own maps on it and you can do everything you want in terms of taking the track log. So this device with an SD card in it of two gigabytes does everything you want for the project. 
at, a, at about that sort of 180 euros. Um, you can enter much cheaper than that by just having something that just logs. And, and to be quite honest, there are many, uh, this one being handed up here, little, little device like this. Um, there are devices that, that stand alone like this one. There are devices that will uh, allow you to use your mobile phone just with a piece of software on your mobile phone and do it. So there is effectively, if, if your mobile phone already has the GPS receiver in it, you just need a piece of tracking software. Um, the other one. Okay, so in terms of the, once you've got that log, then you simply either upload it to the server or within JOSM software offline, load it in, and from that point you can start tracing over the top. The um, what about house numbers? Um, I've read that there's a lot of discussion about the encode uh, and tag house numbers. Is there something um, like a recommendation that needed? Uh, there, is, uh, there is a lot of debate about it. Um, I think that the debate is just getting over complicated. Um, I, I added a lot of house number data just by putting uh, reference equals and the number. Um, because that's all you actually need. If it's on the house, you know that the, it's not going to be any other reference to anything else. Um, but there is a, a Karlsruhe, have, have, the guys there have done a, a, um, a pretty good little schema that actually uh, does uh, house numbers quite nicely. Um, but essentially, the main question has been about, well, should the house numbers be on the roadway so that you can route to them easily, or should they be on the physical houses that are off the side? And the debate is all about that. Because obviously, to put them on the houses by the side, you've got to put them all individually. And it's a lot easier just to put things on the street. But then if you put them on the street and someone moves the node, it's now then in the wrong place. So the preferred way is to do it where, is, is to always come back to what is, what is reality? If the house number is a, is a building off the street, that's what should be referenced with the number, and you put the reference in that way. So yes, on, on, the, uh, on the wiki there is a, a schema which most people, I won't say most, but is generally being used at the moment as a, as a starting point. It's very, very early days for putting house number data and, and address data generally into OpenStreetMap. Yeah, we've got one over here first. I, I was twice this size before I started. Yeah. It, it, it is a great way of keeping fit, um, especially on a bike. It's, it's a fantastic way also of seeing an area that you thought you lived in, but you never really knew because you, you, go and you go down every single street. So you go down those cul-de-sacs that you've never been down before, and it's amazing what you find. You also find lots of little footpaths and cut-throughs that you never knew existed. And in some cases, you find things very close to you that actually will benefit your life in terms of, oh, I can actually get through there. How do you find every street? How do you find every street? There's, there's a t two techniques um, um, in terms of mapping systematically. There are those that always turn left. Okay, so if you always turn left, you come back eventually to the position you started in. Uh, I do it the, uh, slightly differently. I always take the first junction, whether it be left or right. And in the same way, you can actually roughly achieve the same sort of thing. I find that a little bit more productive. But you can map absolutely everything if you're very, very carefully systematic. But you don't have to do that. Well, you can do what you like and then let somebody else fill it in. We have uh, started to get a little problem with um, what we would call vandalism and spam. Um, it's relatively easy to spot it because it just doesn't look right. And so uh, somebody a few months ago in the UK decided to make their own monorails and roads and motorways in the middle of a national park. Um, we think it was just somebody having a play. It might have even been a child, actually, because of just the type of things that have been done. Um, 
very easy to revert it and take it out. And it was spotted very quickly because there's a lot of people looking at the data all the time. Uh, we we have the, the coastline itself of most of the world is available, um, again, free data source from the US, the PGS uh, coastline data. So we've, we've been, over time, importing that. And so most of the coastlines around the world are there within the database. Um, but in terms of getting extra information, for instance, on most traditional maps, quite often you'll see a high water and a low water line. Well, unless somebody can find a way of doing that, getting that and walking along it at high water or low water is unlikely to go in very quickly. Um, beyond that, in terms of subsea, there is talk of people actually starting to think about subsea uh, below the water mapping. Whether that's right that it's in open street map or really it should be a separate project, I leave for another discussion. We'd like to encourage it though because we don't really see uh, any difference in what it's doing if, if, you, if you've got information relating to subsea. We, we, do, we do add things like beacons and uh, maritime information that's, that's near the coastline and we put ferry routes on but otherwise we tend to, to leave out anything in the air so we don't put aerial routes on and we don't put um, uh, things to do with the water itself. Okay, we have our last um, Who pays for the servers? Uh, we are uh, generously hosted at uh, University College London, UCL, um, and they provide our main bandwidth and uh, space for the servers. The servers themselves are purchased and owned by, normally owned by the foundation. So uh, what happens is that um, uh, we have a need to either put new disks in or, or increase the, uh, uh, the performance of a particular unit. We have roughly about I think it's now we're about eight servers altogether. So some are doing database, some are rendering tiles to see the map, some are doing other functions. Um, so there's about that altogether that are sitting in, in, a, in a cabinet at UCL. And uh, as we need to buy a new one, then we, as a foundation, will pay for the hardware and uh, then volunteers will go in and install it and, uh, and, and, and get the operating system on it. Uh, and, and then beyond that, it's down to the community to get it functioning. So it's, all, it's actually very low cost. We don't pay for any bandwidth. The wiki is run and hosted uh, by ByteMark um, in the UK. They generously provide that. And we've recently just gone from a virtual machine to a dedicated machine. They've, they've literally updated us last month. Yeah. What do you feel with uh, legal restrictions, for example, military facilities and things like Yeah, mil military restrictions and places where you are not allowed to map. Um, this extends to much bigger because let's think about the Beijing Olympics right now. It's illegal to create a map in China. It's illegal to use a little GPS in China. To, in, in order to make a map in China, you have to have a license. So you can't go out and just do it. Having said that, you look at Beijing, if you want to go and zoom in, you'll find some mapping there. Now, how's it being done? I don't know. <laughs> So what I'm saying is that restricted areas are going to end up in the map, no doubt about it. How they get there, who cares? I mean, we, we don't condone any illegal activity, but at the end of the day, we don't know how the stuff gets in there. We don't even know that it's accurate. We've got no way of telling. So or, or it's, a wiki, it's a wiki map. If two people agree it's the same thing because somebody else has gone back and seen that it looks right, then it's probably going to stay in the map. There's nothing to stop the Chinese government coming in on the website and deleting the whole lot of China. But you can bet your bottom dollar the following day we'd have it all back in again just with the history. Um, well, it, the, what, we, what we say to people is if you're, if you're a, uh, an individual, then there is no restrictions on using either the API, the API directly. Take the data you want if, if you're an individual doing it. If you're a commercial business and you're trying to build something as an application from the data, either work with the planet file, which has everything in except the history. It's a dump each week of everything except the history. Or you go to one of the new companies like CloudMade and say, we'd like to have the data 
either as tiles or mobile tiles for mobile application, whatever. That's the sort of thing that likes of CloudMade uh, are doing. So it's available, you just have to be careful. The big question is if you, if you know you've got something you want to do or you think that your business might want to do but you're not sure how to approach it, is send a mail to the developer list on at OpenStreetMap and you'll get a response back that gives you better guidance. Thank you very much. Thank you.